are the lesser lights. We need to be burning so that these uh, people will be guided by the lesser light to the greater light, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we can make a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. I thank God for allowing me to live in this uh, earth for 56 years now, and uh, the Lord has been uh, so gracious uh, to me. I have lived uh, more than half of this uh, life in the ministry. I regret the times that I failed him and let him down, but I do not regret the times that he chastised me and teach, teach me things that I need to learn so that I can become a better Christian. I appreciate the Lord for giving me a church. Uh, by the uh, grace of God, this is the third church that he allowed me to start to in the Philippines and one here in Cambodia. And I always thank God for the people that is allowing me to meet in uh, the churches that the Lord used me in order to be started, especially now here in Cambodia, that not only that the church uh, has been built, but now the Lord has given, has given me a guide on really what to do this time so that the Word of God will really be published more than when I was uh, pastoring in the Philippines. I thank God for correcting me in so many areas of doctrine and principles that I have taught before, but they were wrong. I thank God for giving me another chance so that I will be able to really study His Word. And by doing so, we'll be able to correct those things that were thought before that were wrong so that people that I might have misled will be given a chance to go to the right way, the right path, and the right understanding of the Word of God. And because of that, I really appreciate Him. And I also appreciate God for allowing me to see my uh, granddaughter and my grandson coming soon. <laughs> for I hope the Lord will allow me to see that too. And... The many, many children that our people here in church are producing. So let us win them and let us make them. Amen. So that we will uh, both grow uh, by soul winning and biologically. <laughs> so uh, let's continue to pray that the Lord will uh, continue to bless us. Actually, there is no question that God will bless it is the only question of if we are going to be worthy of all the blessings of the Lord. Of course, we are not worthy, but we thank Him because He placed us into the ministry and He counted us worthy, not because of us, but by virtue of what the Lord Jesus Christ had done in our lives. So I hope and I pray that this day will be a day that we can really give to the Lord and glorify His name more. I thank God for the Sunday school that we just had. I thank God for giving us these uh, advance notices so that we can be ready in facing the things that we are going to face as we embark in a great work of trying to biblically educate our brethren in the Lord. We are not taking this up because we are better than them. No. The truth or all the truths are already in the Bible. All we have to do is to mine for them. All we have to do is search for them. All we have to do is to ask and beg the Holy Spirit to illuminate our mind and give us wisdom so that we will be educated in the Word of God. And as we learn, we want to share the things that God is entrusting unto us because we are stewards of the truths that God has given. And in so doing, we receive a lot of ridicule. We receive a lot of mockings from, sad to say, people who should be desiring to know the truth. But we are in a battle. What do we expect? We are in a spiritual battle and in every battle, there will be casualties. 
In every battle, some people will be hurt. But in every battle, people will stop or people will continue. But if we know what we are fighting for, then there is no reason why we must stop. We need to keep on keeping on because if we will stop, then there will be no chance that Christianity, per se, will come back to the basics of the Word of God. We have gone so far, and as our speaker a while ago mentioned, it, will, it may take several generations to bring this uh, truth back into the hearts of the people of God. But we will just keep on keeping on by His grace because in the end, God will be victorious. Amen? Shall we stand up and we will pray? Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, you saved us. Not only from the penalty of sin, but you're saving us from the power of sin. And later on, you will save us from the presence of sin. We thank you, O oh God, because of your enormous love for each and every one of us. Though we are not worthy, there is nothing in us that is lovable, O oh God. But because you are love, you loved us. And you gave your only begotten Son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, O oh God, because if not for that, then all of us are on our way to hell. But thank you because of your love and your sacrifice, we are now on our way to heaven. You have given us, Lord, the task that we should guide those people who are still in darkness to find the light, to hear the gospel, to find forgiveness, and for their name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. I pray, O oh God, that we will not fail you, but we will heed to all your words, and that we will realize, O oh God, that you are the one commanding us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And we thank you, Lord, because you did not only give us the command, but you have given us, Lord, not only your provision to do it, but most of all, your presence. And, Lord, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So I pray, O oh God, that if you will call us, we will just say yes, that we will never second guess, that we will never say no, and that, O oh God, we are going to just do your will in our lives for as long as we live. Help me, Lord, as I preach your word. Because my thoughts, Lord, are so low compared to your thoughts that if not for the wisdom that the Holy Spirit will give, I will only be babbling the whole day. But if the Holy Spirit, please, and see, see it fit to use me today, O oh God, then this day will be a blessing for each and every one of us. May you be glorified in our midst as we preach and help your people as they listen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. So we're going to preach. I'm going to preach today about the topic, how to be used by God. How to be used by God. You see, the life of Moses can be divided into three 40-year periods. If you're going to preach about the life of Moses, it is so easy to outline. There will be the first 40 years. Where he, was, where he thought that he was somebody. And then the next 40 years, where he thought that he was a nobody. And then the last 40 years, when he saw that God can use a nobody to become somebody in the ministry of the Lord. So we can see also here that failure is only temporary if you will keep on keeping on for God. We saw that Moses failed in his first attempt he got discouraged that he would not want to do it anymore. But then God appeared to him and assured him that he can be used again 
by God. We can see here that we are serving a God who will, who will always give us chances as long as we keep on trusting the Lord. Amen. We can see here a God who will not give up on us. That is why we should not give up on God. We can see here a God who always cares for us that even in the time where it seems that God is quiet, it seems that God is distant, it seems that God is not doing anything, we can be assured that the hands of God is always in our lives, working all together for good, waiting for the right time that He can use us to glorify His name. There is no a person that cannot be used by God if that person will desire in his heart and will make himself ready to be used of the Lord. Uh, maingay, maingay. Uh, ano natin? So, the first 40 years Moses spent in the palace of Pharaoh in Egypt. In Acts chapter 7 and verse number 22, we can see that the Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So we might you know, think that why did God not use Moses when he was in this stage of his life? You see, before this, Moses already knew that he's going to be used by God in order to uh, free the uh, Israelites under Egyptian bondage. And at this particular time, the Bible says that Moses already had wisdom. He's, he was already, already a learned person and he was mighty in words and in deeds. But why is it that God did not use him? Because of the word Egyptians. You see, what we know in this world is not enough in the ministry of the Lord. We may be smart in this world, but we can be foolish before God. We may think that we are better than other people, but we are actually nothing before God. Sometimes the skill that we learn from this world is the very thing that we are using in order to serve God. Ladies and gentlemen, God is served in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because the flesh will only puff us up. It will give us ego. It will give us pride. But when we serve God according to the spirit, humility will follow every victory in our lives. That is the reason why we need to understand that God's work must always be done God's way. Because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But then thereof are the ways of death. So the next 40 years, Moses is spent in Midian on the backside of the desert, tending the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. It was during this time that Moses was formed, fashioned, and fitted as a vessel that God can use in the ministry. You see, sometimes our downtime, we thought of, well, I'm wasting my time. No, ladies and gentlemen, there must always be a time wherein we can be quiet, wherein we can sit down, wherein we can be alone and reflect about the things that God wanted to do in our lives. It is not always going. Yes, God asked us to go, but there is also a time of waiting. And when the time of waiting is finished and we are ready for the ministry, then God will say, go! And we can go the distance by the grace of God. You see, there are dangers when we are serving God. Number one, we can see that in serving God, we encounter the danger of running ahead of God's will. We are making our own schedule. We are do doing our own plans. And we are doing the work of God the way that we perceive that we can do it. So Moses tried to, to liberate his people during that time. And what happened? He was ostracized from Egypt. It's a good thing that he was not killed because he belonged to the family of Pharaoh. He was only uh, uh, vanished from that place until he reached this backside of the desert. So be careful of becoming overzealous or be careful of uh, going ahead of time. See to it that it is God's green light before we go. 
God is not in a hurry. But pastor, the Bible says redeeming the time. You put things in pro proper context. Yes, we need to redeem the time. But it doesn't mean that we need to always be out there. Sometimes redeeming the time is making ourselves uh, ready to do God's will. So that's why we need to understand the word of God. For without which we are going to do things according to our way and plan, not according to the will of God. So this constitutes the first 40 years of Moses' life. Number two is retreating after we have failed the second 40 years of his life. You see, when we fail, we get discouraged. When we fail, we get disappointed. And when we fail, we are traumatized to the point that we do not want to try it again. Because maybe of the shame, of the stigma that we received when we fail. But ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to look at success, most of the ingredients of success is failings. Look at the one who discovered the fluorescent lamp. He failed 1,000 times. But he keeps on keeping on. And then he was able to find the right element that will burn for a long, long time. Almost all of the scientists who discovered many important things that are helping us today failed so many times. That is why science is about experimentation. And every failure is actually a success because you know what you're not going to do anymore. That's why there is success in failing. And that is also the reason why the Lord will give us trial after trial after trial so that we can fail and fail and fail. But in our failure, we will learn, learn, and learn. And as we learn, it will make us ready that when we go out there, we are going to avoid many failures in our life. Amen. That is the importance of training. Before you become a soldier ready for the actual battle, you will be trained and you will be hit by rubber bullets. So that next time you will know not how to dodge the bullet, but not to go out there and make yourself uh, just uh, a sitting duck for those people who will shoot you. But then again, once you learn these things, you will be uh, brought into the battle and when you're in the battle, you know what to do. So this is what, what happened to Moses. In those second 40 years of his life, he learned that he cannot do God's work his way. So he retreated and he thought it's going to be the end of him. He thought that his life will be about tending the ship, will be about caring for the ship, will be about serving his father-in-law at the backside of the desert. And then number three, listen. Amen. Do you like this kind of preaching? Amen. Amen. Number three. After retreating and then feeling of inferiority that we will never be used of God again. And that is the most dangerous aspect or, or, or encounter when we are serving God. When you come to a point in time when you will say, maybe I am not cut out for it. Maybe I cannot do it. Maybe God will use somebody to do it. Why? Because once I failed and maybe I will not be able to be successful again. You listen to me. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. You may fail. But you keep on keeping on. You may fail, but you stand up. You may fail, but you go back to the drawing board. And you ask God to teach you. You ask God to give you wisdom. And after God has taught you, then you go back there in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of God. And mind you, God will give you the victory. Amen. That is how we should serve the Lord. So it started the 40 years of his life. But then Moses saw that God is a God of the second chance. Like Jonah, he was given a chance to serve God again. Like Gideon, he was given a, a chance, a sign by God that he can still be used 
of the Lord. Like David, after he committed murder, after he committed adultery, that God said, David, I am going to use you again. And in the end, David became a man after God's own heart. As long as we are alive, God is not finished with us. And if God is not finished with us, don't raise your hand. Don't throw in the towel. Why? God can still turn things around for us. Amen? So, Moses spent, as I have said, the first 40 years thinking he was a somebody. You see, when you think that you are a somebody, then it means that you are a nobody. Because the Bible says that without God, there is nothing that we can do in life. And then he spent the next 40 years of his life learning that he was a nobody. So he learned that he was a nobody. First, he thought that he was a somebody. Then he learned that he was a nobody. And then he spent the last 40 years of his life understanding that God will only use the nobodies in order to glorify his name. Amen? Because if God will use a person who is thinking that he's a somebody, then all of the glory will be taken by that person. But the reason why God is using us, so that God can get the glory, not us. You see, as people of God, we are God's trophies. What God wants is that when people will look at us, they will see that we are a workmanship of God. Because he will do things that we cannot do for ourselves. You see, when God saved us, the Bible says he began a good work in us. Philippians 1 6. Amen. And then the Bible says he will perform it until that day when the Lord comes, when we die, or in the day of the Lord. So we need to say, when we got saved, God started to work a work in us. And the Bible says he will. When God says, I will, it means he will. When God says, I will, it means it will happen. Why? Because we are no match for God. Because Satan is no match for God. Because God is a sovereign God. If he says, I will start a good work in you, be sure God will finish it no matter what. God has a lot of tools to do that. He established the church to teach you. He gave you the word so that you can learn. There is chastisement that will put us back into the way. That is why a Christian should show life and growth because of the Holy Spirit. If nothing is happening in our lives, then be afraid. Because God said, I will begin a good work and I will finish it. So there must be progress in our Christian life. That is why we have justification when we got saved. We are proclaimed not guilty. And then we enter into sanctification. Meaning to say that we are daily cleansed by God through His Word, through His work, through His promises in our life. So as we look at our life, there must be progress. And if there is no progress, maybe there is no life in the first place. That's why we have been talking about this for quite a while. There is no such thing as a Christian that will backslide for a long time. You cannot resist the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot just say no to the Holy Spirit without a tremendous struggle in your heart. And let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit will not stop chastising you until we go back to the path where He wants us to be in in the first place. So sometimes we are thinking that we can just say no to God. Sometimes we're thinking uh, as if God is nothing. Sometimes we're thinking it is as if God uh, must conform to what we want. Ladies and gentlemen, God is sovereign. He can overpower each and every one of us. Amen? 
So Moses saw that in his life. And then Moses was deeply convinced at the end of the second 40 years that he was, as I have said, a nobody. And he tried to actually give excuses after excuse concerning why he was not qualified. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not us who qualifies. It is God who qualifies. That is why don't say that I cannot amount to anything if God says I'm going to use you. You see, God can use a stone. God can use any other object in order to glorify His name. But God in His wisdom chose us. So just imagine the privilege that we have. That who are we? That God had chosen us to serve Him. It is greater than the mandate of the king of this world. It is greater than any appointment of the highest official of the land wherein we live. It is a command that was given to us by the king of kings and the lord of lords. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, it is about God. When God opens doors, we must be quick to enter in. Because God is going to use us. So Moses came to a point in time when he says, No, Lord, I cannot do it. I am a nobody. Little did Moses know, knew, that that is where God wants him to be because that is how God is going to use him. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The first requirement in serving God is to deny ourselves. Not to put any trust in ourselves. Not to put any confidence in ourselves. Not to bank on what we have learned by ourselves, but only to be empty of anything in our life and allow God to fill us with His wisdom, with His word, with His promises, with all the things that are from God. And when God filled us up, then we can serve Him and glorify His name. Amen? Paul says, I die daily. Paul says, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So today, we are going to look at Moses' graduation day. The burning bush sets before us God's commissioning service in the life of Moses. So I'm going to only give you three points regarding this uh, passage that we're going to study today. Number one is the words that we need to reflect on. The words that we need to reflect on. So no doubt Moses learned many valuable lessons at the burning bush. However, the greatest lesson that he learned was this. It was God that does the work Man is just an instrument. It is God that does the work. Man is just an instrument. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, please. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, because Paul is a linguist. Paul is a knowledgeable person. Paul sat at Gamaliel's feet. But he said, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When you serve God, it is not about you. When you serve God, you don't let people know you. When you serve God, there is only one thing that you're going to say, and that is to proclaim who God is and what God wants to accomplish in their lives. He says, I determine that there is only one person that you will know from me, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why? Because without God, we cannot accomplish anything. Paul is saying, if God is not with me, there is simply nothing that I can do by myself. 
Look at verse number 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration with the Spirit and of power. Ladies and gentlemen, we just have to preach the Word. Amen. This is sometimes we... What is a good illustration that can really touch the, the emotion of the people when I preach? What, what will I say that will, make, that will make them have goosebumps and all of these things? Ladies and gentlemen, we are the herald of truth. We preach the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And let the Holy Spirit do His work in the hearts of the people. Most of the time, we are doing the work of the Holy Spirit. We pressure people to get saved. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot do it. You may persuade people, but if they're not convicted by the Holy Spirit, it is all emotion. And nothing more that we are doing in their lives. Look at verse number 5. That your faith, listen, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Can you see that, ladies and gentlemen? Nakikita pa natin yun? That is why it is so sad when Christians will give this reason. I believe it because that is what my pastor said. You are standing in the wisdom of men. And sometimes I cannot fault you. Do you know why? Because your pastor came to the point of making you believe that he is sort of a final authority when it comes to the teachings of the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, no. I may say a lot of things. You test it according to the Word of God. If I am wrong, you correct me and I am going to listen to you. Why? Because our final authority is the Word of God and our faith must stand in the power of God. Amen? Not in the wisdom of men. Kaya mga kapatid, yung matatalinong tao makapagtatayo ng malalaking simbahan. Hindi nakapagtatakayon. Kulto nga, hindi ligtas, nakapagtatayo ng malalaking simbahan eh. Hmm. Look at Eli Soriano. Look at Manalo. Look at uh, Villanuevas. Look at these people. They can build big ministries. Why? Because they are wise. But their people, the faith of their people is standing in their wisdom, not in the power of God. So that when testings and trials will come, they will fall up. Why? Because they built a foundation or they built their house upon a sinking sand. But if you believe the word of God, you build your house upon the rock. Amen. And all of these elements may come, but your house will remain because it was founded on the right foundation. That is why it is very important that we know we are only instruments. And the instrument cannot protest. The instrument cannot tell the one handing, no, no, that's not the way. This is how you do it. The instrument will not say that. The instrument is in total dependence upon the one using such an instrument. What did Moses see when he was there? You see, for Moses, the day started like any other day. He's been doing this for 40 years. Imagine doing something for 40 years. Even when you close your eyes, you can do it. Even when you are half asleep, you can do it. Even if nobody tells you how to do it, you can do it. Why? Moses has been doing this for 40 years. For him, this is just a routine day. This is just an ordinary day. He is not expecting anything to change this day. But this day is the day that God will change everything for Moses. You see, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we should be expectant because any day, God can change our lives. In any message, God 
can speak to us to change our lives. At any time, God may step in and interrupt our little sorry life and will give us something that will occupy us for the rest of our existence in this world. God is going to change the life of Moses, but listen, when God changed the life of Moses, it affected the whole of Israel. You see the point, ladies and gentlemen? When God changes the life of Moses, it affected the whole nation of Israel and their history from that day until the Lord will establish His millennial kingdom. Meaning to say, even if you are only one, but you are with God, you can influence or impact the world if you will allow yourself to be used by God in whatever capacity He wants to use you. Amen? So He thought it's going to be just another day. But God has other plans. As I have said, He will change the life of Moses. He was there for 40 years, but this time, something was different. Here was an ordinary bush that Moses sees every day. He saw bushes burning almost every day of his life. But this is not just an ordinary bush because this bush has been burning but is not being consumed. You see, the ordinary bush became an extraordinary bush. Why? Because God is in it. We may be ordinary. We may be nothing. But if God is in us, then we can become extraordinary. We can become super ordinary. God can use us and we can be an influence and an impact in the lives of many people. Moses saw the bush. It was burning, but it was not being consumed. Do you know why? Because the one that is that caused the bush to burn is God. And it is the glory of God. You see, God is forever. He cannot be consumed. So as long as God is in that bush, that bush will remain there. It will never be consumed. You see, the God of the burning bush is a holy God. That's why when Moses turned aside, and he said, I'm going to look at this because that bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. When Moses is about to do that, God says, Moses, Moses. You see, Pastor, why does God have to repeat the name of Moses? Is Moses kind of deaf? Of course not. Does God not know that Moses heard him the first time? Of course God knew. God is all-knowing. But in the Hebrew language, in the English language, when we say something very important, we use what we call a comparative and superlative uh, words like better, best, more, most. But in the Hebrew, when they want to emphasize something, they repeat the word or they repeat the phrase. That's why Jesus in John 5.24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Because it is something important, so God will emphasize it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. Born again is very important. That's why it was repeated. And here, the call to Moses is very important. That is why he repeated the name of Moses. So Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And then he was commanded and he was told that the ground where he was standing is a holy ground. Listen, wherever the presence of God is, it will make that place holy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you believe that God is present here? Amen. So this is now a holy place. So we better act accordingly. Because we are in a holy 
place wherever God's presence is that is a holy place don't you know that God is present in us so we are a holy nation we are a holy person that is why Paul even the Corinthian Christians were called saints or holy ones or separated ones for God so wherever God is it is a holy place and we better act in holiness why? because God demands holiness from his people be ye holy for I am holy so he called Moses and he said you're on holy ground remove your sandals or your shoes from thee why? I, I know a church they remove shoes maybe because that is a holy ground and uh, actually I, I attended that church once in my life the only time that I went there and I saw them removing their shoes but during that time I was a Bible student you know, a Bible student uh, no money almost uh, all our uh, clothes were either you know given to us or donated and all of these things and and my socks uh, have holes and I said what am I going to do <laughs> if I'm going to remove my shoes then people will see that that my <laughs> my socks have holes so I, I I let them all first all go in and then I remove it and then uh, in a very subtle way went to a place wherein they will not be able to look at my socks well, maybe the reason why they're allow, uh, asking people to remove their shoes is because it is a holy ground. Well, if God is there, then it's holy. But this is a different thing. This is a metaphor when God told Moses, remove your shoes, because God is now telling Moses, Moses, before I called you and you did things your way. Before I called you and you did your work in the energy of the flesh. But now that I am calling you again, those shoes represent your flesh. Those shoes represent your activity. Those shoes represent the work of man's hand. This time, you are going to serve me not in your way, not in your mind, but you will serve me in the power of my Holy Spirit. So he said, remove it. Because you cannot serve me in your own power. So, Moses met the God of the burning bush is a holy God. Not only that, but the God of the burning bush is a compassionate God. He told Moses, I have heard, I have seen the affliction of my people. So God is a compassionate God. Don't you ever think that God will leave you for one second when you are a child of God. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He will always be with us. Amen. Doing something, even if we think that God does not even care for us. No, God cares because our God is a compassionate God. Do you remember when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was up on a mountain and he looked at Jerusalem and he saw what Jerusalem is doing and he saw what will happen to Jerusalem and he wept. He wept. Not he wept. He wept for Jerusalem. And he says, how long? How long, Jerusalem, will I have to take care of you like a hen? who's gathering her chicks under her wings, how long am I going to care for you, Jerusalem? When Jesus was in the flesh, he was filled with compassion. That's why don't you ever think that Jesus is not hurting when we are hurting. Don't you ever think that he cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Because he was tempted in all points as we are. And yet without sin. He knew what we are going through. He knew our struggle. And he's a compassionate God. And he said, Moses, I saw, I heard the affliction of my people. So I 
came in order to set them free. So the God of the burning bush is a compassionate God. Amen? He will deliver His people from their affliction. The God of the burning bush is an imminent God. Pastor, what do you mean imminent? He's a God that is always at hand. That He can step in our life anytime, any minute, any second, even now. You see, these people thought that God does not care for more than 400 years. But what they did not realize is this. You see, Satan wants to destroy the people of God. Are we in agreement with that? Amen? He hates Israel because Israel bears the name of God. So Satan did everything to annihilate Israel. But the mere fact, listen to this, that they survive for more than 400 years is a clear evidence that God is working in their lives. Amen? Why did God wait that long for Israel before he stepped in to deliver them? Because Israel is a stiff-necked nation. And sometimes hard-headed, stiff-necked people takes a long time to be disciplined. You understand what I'm saying? So God allowed them to be very, very afflicted so that when God will finally come to their rescue, they will realize that it is really the power of God that is working in their lives. Amen? So it's an imminent God. Listen to me. God can change your life now if you wanted to. God will make a difference in your life now. He can say something. He can use me now to say something that will forever change your life. Amen. I remember I was preaching. Uh, I was in San Fernando Bible Baptist Temple. I was given a chance by our pastor to preach. I can say that it was the worst preaching that I have ever preached in my life. It, is, it seems that I was just bubbling. I was just saying words that I even could not really understand what happened to the preaching that day. So after the preaching, while they're praying the closing prayer, I went back to my room and I cried. I said, oh God, what happened? I'm so ashamed. I do not even want to face the people because of what happened to that preaching. But little did I know, two weeks after that, one of the members approached me and she said, Brother Joel, thank you. I said, why? The preaching two weeks ago? And I said, oh no. But she said, you said something there that made me realize and make a decision in my life that no matter what happens, I'm going to stay serving the Lord. And again, I cried and I said, Lord, forgive me. Because I judge what I am doing in the result that I can see. Sometimes we do not realize that the result will come later on. What is important is our faithfulness in doing our job for the Lord. Amen? So, He is an imminent God. He can change your life. And the God of the burning bush is a God who commissioned His people to participate in His purpose. This is what I am talking about a while ago. You see, God can do everything, but in His wisdom, He saw it fit to involve us in His plan of saving mankind. That is why our participation in the ministry is only a privilege. Hindi po ito utang na loob ng Diyos sa atin. Hindi po ito, uh, Panginoon, paano kung ayoko, ano na mangyayari? Walang mangyayari sa iyo. Pero laging may mangyayari para sa Diyos. Amen? You see, the command in verse number 5, Moses removed your shoes and is saying that you need to step out of what you can do and you need to step in of what I can do. You need to step out of all your fears. You need to step out of all your failures. You need to step out of all your frustrations. You step out from your past. You live in the present and I will show you how to be victorious in the future. That is what God 
is telling Moses, step out of what you can do and see what I can do through you. So what should we remember? We need to remember that in order for God to use us, we must not forget that we are just the instrument or vessel and that God is the power through which the work gets done. Listen, it is not about me. It is all about God. It is all about His glory. Don't you know that we are created for the glory of God? Amen? We are created for the glory of God. He saved us for His glory and He will not share His glory to any man. You see, that is the whole point. Whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all for the glory of God. Listen to me. There lies the difference in how we serve God. There lies the difference in how we worship God. You listen to this. There are two aspects in the glory of God. Number one is the intrinsic glory of God. Pastor, what do you mean? The intrinsic glory of God is the sum total of who He is. His characters, His attributes, His omniscience, uh, His omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful, His love, His righteous, His wisdom, His holy. Uh, all of this, you joined it together, you put them all together, that is the intrinsic glory of God. God is glorious whether you like it or not. God is glorious whether you believe it or not. God has what you call intrinsic glory. So why do we have to glorify God? That is what you call the ascribed glory to God. Okay. How we understand God is how we will glorify God. If you have a low estimation of God, you cannot worship Him deeply. Your worship will be shallow. Sorry to say, but look at the charismatic at, the, at Pentecostal. They need to maintain excitement because that is the only thing that keeps them going, not the intrinsic glory of God. That's why they need to, to make many different tactics in order to keep the people. There is one church when there is a ventilation and then there is a light and that is focused on the ventilation and then there will be of course if the light is focused there there will be a dust particles and they will uh, allow the fog to to permeate the place and they will say look at the glory of god look at the glory of god and they will shout and they will dance under the glory of god ridiculous they need excitement in order to keep on going but if you know God you understand God you do not need anything but God is enough that we will worship him and serve him for the rest of our lives intrinsic the deeper we know God the higher our worship is the deeper we experience God the higher is the elevation of our worship to God that is why people and say people cannot worship God because they know not God. That's why they worship Him in stones, wood, carved wood, and, and inanimate objects and nature and all of these things. Why? They do not know the intrinsic glory of God. But that is what we should know. That is why knowing God is very vital in our life. That's why it says, grow in grace and in the knowledge. As you know God, you can serve Him more. You can worship Him more. That is why Paul says that I may know Him. Because as Paul keeps on knowing God, you can see that Paul keeps on elevating his worship and his service to God. So ladies and gentlemen, if we cannot worship and serve God well, it is because we do not have an adequate knowledge 
of the intrinsic glory of our God. The only glory that we can give God is ascribe glory. And listen, our giving glory to God will not add to His glory nor diminish, diminish His glory because God is glorious no matter what. But it depends on how we glorify God in our lives. Amen? So that is why we need to understand these things so that we can really serve Him. When Moses before served him, he does, he does not know him well. But now that Moses knew God well, he was able to serve him well at the last 40 years of his life. Point number two. Pastor, sabi mo kanina, patapos na. Birthday ko ngayon. Ito regalo nyo. Makinig, amen? <laughs> number two. God's promise that we can claim in life. Verses 11 to 12. Anyway, just read it. God tells Moses that he's going to send him to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bandage in verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. Three ten. Come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That's good. That's thrilling. That's exciting. Amen? E example, God will tell us, Hey, I am going to save the Cambodians. Oh, said, yeah. oh, we will say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, God, please save. Cambodian souls, we appreciate you. We glorify you. Serving them. Look at verse number 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that hand, etc., etc. And then you said, the gift besides and all of these things. Moses said, oh yes, God, please. But then, let us go back to verse number 10. This is exciting, right? Come now, therefore, and I will send thee. Oops. Moses said, Lord, it is exciting that you will save Israel. But when he heard, I will send thee. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Lord, I was there before. Lord, I have failed. Lord, it is exciting that you save Israel. Go ahead, Lord. But don't involve me in that. Why? Because I am nothing. I am nobody. I cannot do it. I will not be able to do anything for those people because I once tried, but I failed. But God told Moses, Moses, I will be with thee. Amen. Listen, is the presence of God not enough to assure us of victory? This is sometimes our problem is we look at ourselves and we feel inadequate. Yes, it is true. But ladies and gentlemen, if God is with us, then who can be against us? We're forgetting that. You see, we say that we trust God, but we look at our ability and decide if we can do it or not. What's the point of trusting? Why will we trust God if we will look at our ability and then decide if we can do it or not? You see, God told Moses, I created your lips, your mouth, and I can give words out of your mouth. I can do everything, Moses. Moses is forgetting, listen to me, that it is all about God and not about him. When he attempted earlier to deliver his people, it was his power. That's why he failed. Now, God is asking him to do it by the power of God and he is going to be victorious. You see, the first time Moses asked God to be on his side, but this time God is asking Moses to be on his side. There is a great difference. Listen to me. We make plans and we say, Lord, bless my plans. No, God has plans and we should say, Lord, I will follow your plan. Why? Because we, we do not have to ask that God will bless his plan. It is already a blessed plan because it came from God. You see, that's our problem. We want God to obey us. 
Mm. Instead of us obeying God. We give God conditions instead of allowing and obeying God's condition that we can serve Him and obey Him in our lives. Again, I will reiterate, this is not our work. It is God's work. And if it is God's work, it must be done His way. So Moses says, who am I? Who am I? When Moses thought he was qualified before, he wasn't. And when he now think that he was disqualified, now he was qualified. Before Moses has been too quick and impetuous, now he is too slow and reluctant. But listen, if God is not there, don't do it. But if God is there, do it in any which way that it can be done. Amen? Amen. We can see in verse number 12. Look at verse number 12, please. And we're almost halfway. Number 12. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou wast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve, serve God upon this mountain. So listen. God is telling Moses, it is not who you are, Moses. It is who I am. That should be the attitude in serving God. Don't even think of who you are. But just think of who God is. Because if you know who God is, then you are not going to hesitate anything that God wants you to do. Because you know that God will enable. God will supply. God will protect. God's presence will be with you. God will never forsake. So when Moses finally understand that it is God, the creator of the universe, the all-powerful God is the one asking him to do something, then there is only one thing to do, and that is to obey God. Amen? Moses had to learn that God's work is to be done God's way, not by man. God had clearly instructed Moses that he had come to deliver. He said, I am come to deliver, not Moses. God is the one who will deliver. He will only use Moses so that these people will be delivered. Now, next. Moses had to learn that God's work depends on God's ability and not man's ability. Our greatest ability is our availability. And we will only be available if we will allow God to use us and make us fit for the Master's use. You see, most people are so preoccupied that they cannot hear the call of God anymore. Why? We are preoccupied of making money. We are preoccupied of getting power. We are preoccupied of the pleasures that we can receive from this world. And we are not hearing the still small voice that God wants to use us primarily for the salvation of the soul of lost people. We are losing our focus because of ma the many, many voices that is competing for our attention. Money is shouting. Fame is shouting. Pleasure is shouting. But God speaks in a still, small voice. And we can only hear that voice if we will stand still and listen to the voice of God. And then Moses had to learn that God accomplishes work by his own authority, not the authority of man. Because Moses is afraid. They will not listen to me. I am an outcast of Egypt. Why will Pharaoh listen to me? Moses, they do not have to listen to you. It is my authority. And I will make them listen. Remember the ten plagues. That is God's voice of authority. And at the tenth plague, the most powerful man in the world succumbed to the power of God. Amen? And lastly, the person that we need to trust verses 13 and 14. 
just read it I will uh, go on with the uh, message as a creature we need someone to lean on because we are created listen we are created being therefore we are dependent on our creator without us leaning on the creator we will fall down because we cannot stand up by ourselves so here is the declaration from God on whom we are to learn. God is telling Moses, lean on me. God is telling Moses, trust in me. God is telling Moses, I am your only chance. Let us look at the announcement of deity. He says, Moses says, who am I going to tell them that sent me? He says, tell them, uh, what, what is thy name? The Lord said, I am that I am. Do you know the significance of that name? It, mean, it means the self-existent one. God exists by himself and can exist by himself alone. You try to remember that. What, beside whom there is none else without a beginning and without an end. The God who exists independently the God who exists unchangeably and the God who exists eternally when he calls himself I am it comprehends all that God is he is saying I am self-sufficient God so the word need N-E-E-D is only for the creature not the creator we have so many needs but listen to me God needs nothing. Kaya ikaw, minsan papasok pa sa isip natin. Ah, pag nawala ako sa simbahang ito, babagsak to. Is nothing blade ka. God needs nothing. God needs nobody. God can exist by Himself and for Himself alone. You see, sometimes we do not try to understand who God is. That is why we, we, can, we still have pride in ourselves. Listen to this. Listen to this. God has a voluntary relationship to everything He has made. It is up to Him to make a relationship to you or to me or to anything that He has created. It is up to Him. If He does, does not like to have any relationship with us, we cannot do anything. Because his relationship to us is voluntary. But he has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself. No necessary relation. Me, I need support system to survive. I need relationships. I need family. I need you. So that I can survive. I can be happy. So that I can be uh, uh, kind of meaning in my life. But listen, God does not need anybody because he has no necessary relation to anything outside of himself that is why listen to me if God if God says I want to use you you must praise God you must glorify God you must be like the charismatic and Pentecostal and you shout hallelujah why God wants to use me just imagine that this thing that we are doing now this very moment that we are here serving God is a great privilege kaya nga mga kapatid may karapatang kapang tamarin may karapatang kapang walang ganang dumating sa simpahan Pipilitik ka pa na pumunta. My. Binigyan na tayo ng chance. God has given us a chance to do something for Him and with Him. When the truth of the matter, He is He does not even need us. Moses has to learn that. So that if Moses will learn these things, then he will understand what great privilege, what great calling that God has.
has given him. That's why we call our calling the high calling of God. It is a heavenly calling. I am has the sense that God is the becoming one. Pastor, what do you mean? God becomes whatever is lacking in our life. He can supply everything that we need. When God says, I am, it is like giving Moses a blank check. Moses, you identify what you need. Then I am that what you need. Do you what I'm saying? The name I am means that God will be everything in our life. He says, before Abraham was I am. He says, I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am the Messiah. I am the good shepherd. I am the Savior. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true mind. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the bright and morning star. If you need something in your life, then God is the I am that you need. God can supply everything. So that when God told Moses, Moses, go! But God, I am. I'm, I'm not powerful. I am. I am not eloquent. I am. I am not able. I am. I could not do it. I can. I am a sent you. And that should be enough. Ladies and gentlemen, are you not happy? Are you not glad that there is a person that we can rely to? That we can rely on? And that person that we can rely on is the almighty God, the creator of heaven and of earth. Do you want to be used by God? Then learn to rely on him. And as we learn to rely on God, then God will tell you, go. And he will say, I will be with you. And if I am with you, listen to this, Nothing is impossible. Everything is possible with God. Will you be willing to be used of God? Will you allow God to make you fitted for the ministry? Will you be available once the call of God will come into your life? Shall we stand there, please? Every head's bowed.